Welcome to Lazy Reviews. I'm Arvid Jonsson, and I spend much of my spare time watching movies. Sadly, a lot of them are quite terrible, so I have now set myself the task of telling you which movies to stay away from and which movies to watch, especially in horror movie franchises like The Howling. And I can already say that this franchise is the worst one I watched yet. It's, I mean, Friday the 13th is a brilliant franchise. The Chucky franchise is mostly brilliant. Puppet Master is mostly miss, not so much hit. This is garbage. This is the worst. Before we get any deeper uh, into this, I should note I have caught the flu. So if my voice is a bit rough, you know why. Anyway, let's start with the first movie, The Howling. It came out in 1981 and is actually quite a fine flick. That's the only movie in this franchise that I can actually recommend. And not just low key recommend, I can give it a decent recommendation. If you like your werewolf movies, this is a good one. Not top tier like American Werewolf in London or Ginger Snaps, but, but a good one, a good one. You, yeah, you would probably have fun with it. The Howling came out in 1981, which happens to be the year after American Werewolf in London. So I think it's another case of a movie that was inspired by another movie. And I should just, because I'll probably never talk about this movie again. American Werewolf in London, great. The sequel, American Werewolf in Paris, garbage. Don't watch that one. That's already a recommendation here from, don't watch that film. That's, yeah, it's just really, really bad. Um, but The Howling is good. We follow this reporter who gets personally involved in a serial killer case and is traumatized thereof. She's therefore recommended by her doctor to go to this camp, this area, for rehabilitation, which is upstate, and also seemingly at the coast. Well, it's quite obviously is at the coast. We see beaches, we see water. So yeah, it's at the coast. Uh, anyway, most of these people just seem happy-go-lucky people. Nothing really is too special about them, except for two or three of the locals, who are a bit weird, a bit hillbilly, a bit wild and ravenous, one might say like dogs or werewolves. They love red meat, they love wearing furry clothes. So yeah, something odd about them. And the reporter also finds out that the case she was following downtown is linked to this place. And I think I actually won't say more about the movie than this, because this is a good movie. I don't want to spoil it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a good werewolf flick. It's, it's nothing great. It's just an enjoyable little thing about fish out of water and in a place that actually at first doesn't seem unwelcoming, but obviously hides a secret. So how could such a little fine film lead to what is Howling 2, Your Sister's a Werewolf, also known as Howling 2, Sheba the Werewolf Bitch. The film actually starts out quite well, this very, very 80s dance club with punks and wild sunglasses and, and songs about being a wolf. And yeah, just wow, this looks so w wacky 80s. So I actually thought I was in for some good schlock at first. Even the first kill scene where we have are this abandoned construction site having some punks killed by werewolves, that's actually an okay scene. The problem is that only the first 10-15 uh, minutes of this movie take place in the city. Because Christopher Lee, among the brother of the protagonist of the first movie, realized that something might be going on, that there might indeed be werewolves at play here. So they decide to hunt down the werewolves, only to realize that the werewolf we see in the first scene has gone to Transylvania, or Transylvania. I don't know how Christopher Lee would have said it in his old, old days. Sadly, I haven't seen many of his Dracula movies. Sure, they are bliss if you're into that kind of thing. Anyway, so this movie takes place in Transylvania. Only it doesn't. This might be nitpicking, but the movie obviously takes place in Czechia or Czechoslovakia because the film was filmed in Czechoslovakia, in Bohemia, 
at least mostly in Bohemia, and it shows the station they are arriving at of the train, meaning the town the movie takes place in, is called Valka. Valka, in the movie, they say what it means. It means wolf. It does not mean wolf in any of the languages spoken in Transylvania, which would have been most likely either Hungarian, Romanian, or German. No, Valka is a very Slavic word, so they didn't even just try to hide the fact that it was not shot anywhere near Transylvania. And another problem is that they have all the local inhabitants of the town speak Czech. I don't know why, but if you just... So, for those of you who don't know it, Hungarian and Romanian are not Slavic languages. Czech is, Slovak is. So you can definitely hear the difference between the, the languages, and it just really pulled me out of the movie. Yeah, it might be a bit silly to, to talk so much about this thing, but it just shows you how little thought went into this movie. Or at least how little work they did to, to cover the tracks. And actually the only the good thing about this movie might be this weird little quirky Czechoslovak slash... Uh, Transylvanian town because it actually has a good atmosphere. It they, they really mock Eastern Europe in this um, uh, as American movies often do. But it, it it's done in a very it's done in a neat way. There's a carnival. There are a few good scenes shot in that village, and that's probably all the good scenes are shot there. Sadly, too much of the film is taking place not in the village, but in the nearby castle or in the forest. Because we find out that the American werewolf who goes to Transylvania, so what seems to be the idea that this is where the werewolves or, uh, originate from, she goes there to the castle, witnesses this ritual where this old lady drains the life energy of a young lady in a room filled with something between eyes wide shut and any sword and sorcery movie, so people are clad in leather, they're wearing hoods, they, it's... The, these occult scenes are almost good, or almost as bad that they're good, but in the end they're just awful. Poorly shot, poorly executed, costumes are just stupid, but actually this is just... this Compared to the rest of the movie, even these scenes are good, because what we get after this, and we get this more than once in the movie, is the worst sex scene I've seen put on screen. And he is even worse than The Room, because we have two, mostly we fortunately mostly see their backs, bareback people who slowly get more and more hairy because they're werewolves as they're having sex. So we just see these balls of hair on each other, grinding, while a mostly naked lady is sitting in a chair, also getting hairy all over her body, so we see hairy breasts, we see everything. It's really unpleasant. I don't know why this is in this movie, at least I don't know why we get as much of it as we do. If you maybe put two seconds of it in, okay, you can get maybe away with that. So we have at least five seconds of it the first time, and then we have, for what I remember, one more scene, maybe even two more scenes of it. And it's disgusting and it's terrible. Um, so let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Christopher Lee because he is okay in this film. He gives a Christopher Lee performance. He is nothing special. He doesn't save the movie. And but he, he's kind of cool as a vampire hunter. And I think the final thing I can say about the film is the only big fight scene we get is also terrible because it's shot in this dark forest where the werewolves just storm our heroes, and our heroes just cut them all down in a matter of seconds. All we see is just a close-ups of their pistols and their knives swinging, and then werewolves close up of werewolf wounds, and then werewolves falling over. It's, it's just quite honestly very, very bad. So this part is recorded the next day when I realized I really just hadn't touched enough on the sheer insanity of this movie. This film 
could easily have a one hour review in its own right because it's just so full of insane and stupid and also some brilliant things that are just I, I just have to say more than I did already. Um, so I, I did say that the, the movie opened up with this this 80s band. And the thing is, what, what I forgot to mention is it's pretty much the only song we get through the entire movie and it just keeps taking uh, bits of it, sometimes even showing them perform on stage at random parts in the movie. I think it happens at least five times and it's so out of place and it's so terrible. I think, I don't know if they were so happy they got this band to perform this one song. I don't know. It, it feels so weird that they do this. On the same note, the movie ends with them performing the entirety of the song, still with the same shots we have seen before while the credits roll. But what I also didn't <laughs> mention is that this is just a reel of all the best quote unquote scenes in, in the film, which has something I again forgot to mention when, when there's that Harry werewolf sex scene. Shiba or Shiba or Stierba, I think it's Stierba. She's watching those two werewolves have sex while looking very horny and touching herself. And then suddenly she grabs a side of her dress and tears it open, revealing her breasts. It's almost like a breast jump scare. It's just so in your face. And it's just this jutting motion while she do it. she's doing it. And she has fairly large breasts, so it's this... When you watch the film, it, you are really surprised. What, what, what the fuck was that? But, you know, in, in a kind of a good way, because they do look good. It's actually probably, of all the things in this movie, those are the things that look the best. And I'm not trying to be sexist here. It just it just is. It, they look good. Um, only that, again, there will be Harry later on. So I wish we didn't see them. That shot is repeated over and over and over and over when they're doing this best pieces during the, the, the basically a music video they're doing at the end and I counted 16 times of that scene being shown not the scenes it's just the part where she reveals her breasts they were so impressed that they got this woman to do this I have no idea I really hope she was paid a lot to be to, to be shown like this in this film but yeah it's it's insane also during that um, during, during those last four or five minutes that the, the song is playing we also have all the best, some of the best gore in the film because I also forgot to say that it actually has some good effects. Um, it's not amazing. It definitely looks fake, but it is entertaining. There is one guy who has his head crushed from both sides, having his eyes blow out with gut, with gut, uh, with blood gushing out and everything. There's another guy who is killed by this bat monster, and that's also done quite well. There are a few other scenes where the, the effects are actually quite decent. What isn't good, and I forgot to mention that there's actually more magic than just the, the, the where she drains the young woman. There's magic fight and she has this aura. And Christopher Lee is this age-old enemy of Stierba. And they finally have this, this collision of two major forces at the end where she is engulfed in the most fake flames I've seen in any film and they are evaporating together because of magic or something. Those effects are just god awful. They look like poorly rendered children's drawing layered on top of what we see on this, the screen. It's, it's really bad. I also went back and counted how many times we see the hairy sex and I think it was at least three times. But what I also forgot to mention is the big orgy. So at the end of it there's this big leather werewolf orgy where all the werewolves are having wearing mostly leather you actually don't really see breasts or anything i think you see a, a pair or two and no penises or anything and they're just kind of grinding up against each other lying in a big pile so kind of if you were trying to matching the most goofy orgy you could the most stereotypically goofy orgy you can think of in a cartoon and then make it real. That's probably what you would see here. It's just just dressed in leather. It's really bizarre. I don't know. I guess the orgy is there to demonstrate the animalistic nature of the werewolves. But it just ends up being even more goofy. And I should also... I forgot to mention how, how the movie ends on a really stupid cliffhanger. Where there's this child werewolf in it. And it's... Yeah doesn't really go anywhere it's just ooh, did you know there were chill child werewolves as well and it has this goofy neighbor who turns out to be a priest and it's also weird and it's just 
the last two three minutes of the other movie is is this cliffhanger ending, and it's just it shouldn't be in the film. It has no right to be in this film. And I, I think my 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 overwhelming feeling when I leave this film is that it's it's totally all over the place. It's a mix between like eighties leather gangs and then the sword and sorcery film. And then the Hammer Horror movies, and it doesn't blend well together. I think on paper, this sounds like a hilarious movie. And I actually think, I watched this alone. If you watch this movie with a group of friends, you might be a bit entertained, especially if you're drunk. So, so I think I will only recommend the first movie. But I think I can give this one of those weird recommendations that it's just so weird that maybe you should actually see it. Just to know that a movie like this exists, it's it's one of those movies. Anyway, that's that's all I wanted to say. Meaning, I should talk about Howling Three, The Masupials. So this came out in 1987. Howling Two came out in 1985, and both of these have the same director, which is a bit weird because I would say that the tonal difference between these movies is very, very, very big, and also this movie kind of ruins the story of the first and the second one. I mean, the second one already added magic to the universe, which is terrible. I hate when, when movies do that. Just, uh, oh, let's find out something else. Let's expand on this. What can we do? Magic. No, please find another way to make your movies interesting than magic. This movie has no magic in it. Instead, it's what I would call a horror comedy with no horror in it. The opening is actually quite cool as we're following this anthropologist who is an Australian anthropologist and lecturer, shows his class these supposedly old recordings of aboriginals having tied up a werewolf to a tree and then performing a ritual. And this old recording is probably the best part of the movie. It's very short. It's in it twice from what I can recall. But it adds mystery. It's a bit creepy. And I wish the movie went in that direction. Instead, we are following this lady, this girl, who escapes from her werewolf family, who live in the outback and are completely isolated from the rest of society. And she escapes because her dad, the alpha wolf, uh, tries to rape her. So, you know, lovely family dynamics there. She goes to Sydney, where it becomes very apparent that she has never experienced anything about modern life, which also makes it a bit interesting how she gets to Sydney so easily. Oh, she knows how trains and public transportation and money works, but has never seen a camera before or knows what a TV is or anything like that. Uh, again, uh, whatever, it's a movie. And she is then found on a bench by someone working for this low-budget horror movie director and wants to hire her for the film. And a lot of the comedy in this movie, and actually also it's good moments, come from her reactions to the horror director making a werewolf movie and then her watching movies and talking about, oh, this is not how it works. Um, I wish they had done it better because the execution of it is quite bad. But the first 30 minutes of this film, or at least first 20, gave me hope that this would actually be a good film. I think it's a bit healthy for it to be set in Australia. It gives a, a different and interesting setting. But it's not really used that much, other than probably the main usage of it. I know it would also it was also cheaper to shoot in Australia, so that might be one of the reasons. But another reason would probably be just to have the outback werewolves. So the first third, or even the first half of it, is about her hooking up with this guy, and then trying to hide from everyone that she's a werewolf, because this movie starts introducing that you turn into a werewolf from different triggers like flashing light or when you get angry which none of the other movies ever talked about but okay this is how it works in this movie in the other movies they seem to just be able to turn into werewolves when they wanted to and here they need triggers or rituals or sometimes maybe just turn into them for fun because the world has no established rules anymore it's all gone to shit so just run with it and this movie runs because what happens then is that the anthropologist and some other guys go to this outback village. You know, remember, the alpha, the, 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 the outback village wanted her to be raped. That's why she fled. 
But now instead we have to see these people as being victims of modern society as a direct parallel to the aboriginals. I should know that all these werewolves are white, meaning that they would have come from settlers, arguably. So they're not really that tied into the aboriginal story, but it's a big allegory because they're experimented on and they say, oh, we just want to live alone and by ourselves. We don't hunt humans. We don't do anything. So suddenly it's the werewolves are the victims. And I can see how this could work. It's actually not a bad idea. It's just the execution that's bad. And that means that after escaping, or rather after our protagonists avoided captivity, uh, captured by the, the hunters, the, the human hunters, they run into the Australian outback. And here we actually have an aboriginal werewolf. So actually they are tied to the werewolves. But why is there only one aboriginal werewolf? I don't know. We also find out that the werewolves probably come from this. I forgot the name of the animal. Um, but there is this extinct animal that probably bit one of the <laughs> humans. And that's how they turn into werewolves in the first place. Again, that, that's why it doesn't really make sense. Because that means they travel back to... Transylvania for the second movie. I have no idea how these two movies are made by the same guy. It's the story is all over the place and it's terrible. But actually talking about it makes it so, sound probably makes it sound more fun than it really is, because really the last half of the movie is just people running around. Nothing happens. We have one werewolf kill scene that it's okay. No, it's not. It's just okay compared to what we get later. And yeah, these humans trying to hide, and she gives birth to this cup. So she, I think, yeah, it's mostly a wolf she gives birth to, and she has this small pocket in her belly that she keeps it warm. So yeah, it's just really disgusting. It's it's disgusting. And then they start a family just in the middle of nowhere. That guy and his that girl, the human and the werewolf, start a family. And the anthropologists know about this and just wishes them luck. But then I think it's 20 years later, the, well, or maybe it's 15 years later, whatever, uh, werewolves have been legalized. So now they can return to society. So we have this big news story. Oh, now uh, it's no longer illegal to be werewolf. Now they can blend in and, and assimilate with the rest of us. So they leave their house and become big movie stars. Whereas she, he is the director and she is the movie star. And we have even these small scenes with them discussing about nudity in movies and gratuitous violence because she wants to make stylish flicks and he doesn't. And then the very last scene is her turning into a werewolf while accepting an award for the movie they made. But why should this be shocking? Because everybody is shocked about this. Everybody finds it terrifying. But... We already had the news story that no werewolves are accepted in society. <laughs> so what happened? Why this movie makes no sense? It makes no sense. It's 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 all over the place, and that's why on a list of the best movies in this series, this might actually be on the second place, just because it's so messed up in a lot of ways. That actually gives us some entertaining scenes and just makes our mind boggle with, with what, what what what's unfolding because the rest of the movies are just they're, yeah, they're just garbage that there's nothing to them but at least this one tried something different utterly failed but tried something different and actually didn't only make me mad there were some okay things about it and talking about this may actually makes me think that this might qualify as well as a movie that's so Bad is good just because it's so stupid. So the next one, Howling 4, the original Nightmare, actually only came out one year later. Not that it really matters because this one looks so cheap, is so utterly boring that I won't waste your time listening to what's going on because it's all about this couple in a cabin, in a weird place, and then suddenly werewolf. Only we see the werewolf maybe twice. And the only interesting scene in the film is that apparently when you turn into a werewolf for the first time, your body decomposes completely and then a new body is born from it. 
So we have a man melting in front of us, and the, the, the effects are actually really, really good. But this happens about one hour into the movie, if not more, and nothing happens afterwards. It's just one big, boring, bore, ugly, bore fest. It's a waste of time. It's I might be the cheapest movie I've seen in any of the horror movie franchises so far. There's nothing to it. I, I did read that it should be considered more of an adaptation of the original novel than it should be considered a sequel. But it is called Howling 4, so I'm not going to give it a pass for that reason. But again, a different setting. Um, a terrible setting, but a different one. And nothing more to say, really. Those effects were good. Nothing else to say about the rest of the movie. Just a waste of time. Meaning we can talk about Howling 5 The Rebirth. This came out a year later in 1989 and once again takes place in Hungary? So, I don't get this. It's supposed to be Transylvania, I guess, but Transylvania is in Romania today, not in Hungary. Yes, it used to be a part of Hungary, but today it's in Romania. Anyway, it takes place in this castle where this noble family killed itself in the Dark Ages. and. We learn that it's because they were cursed by the werewolf. And that the werewolf left some kind of offspring or something, meaning that someone is still a werewolf. And therefore they need to come back. This movie, I did not understand it. I did not understand the plot. So the plot is that the Hungarian government decided to turn the castle into a tourist destination and therefore invite celebrities from across the world. America, Australia, Scandinavia, and I think a few more places. And they are all different kinds of celebrities. One is a tennis player, one is an actress, one is a historian. I don't why would they invite a historian really? Um maybe to help write the the history of the castle for them? But they already know the history, I don't know. Because all the other people are famous. They are writers, actors, whatever. But then there's also a historian for some reason. And ever since the beginning of the film, the local Hungarian hosts also seem a bit nefarious. But as the plot unfolds, there's no reason for them to be nefarious. They're just, yeah, they, they really seem mischievous and like we should think they're evil. Maybe because they are Hungarians, but I don't know if the film is that racist or just semi-racist. But I will say this about the film, that the dynamic between the different characters, the different famous people, is actually not terrible. The first 20 or 30 minutes of the movie, some of their intrigue and petty rivalries and friendships are actually somewhat interesting to follow it's not great it's just not terrible it's only when people start being killed on and off screen that the movie really gets boring that i'm surprised to say this but in a movie about werewolves it's when the werewolves are introduced that the movie really takes a deep dive into bad territory because we never actually really see a werewolf in the movie all werewolf kills in it are shown up close from a POV point of view or in other ways where it hides the actual perpetrator of the murder because it is a murder mystery this movie is a murder mystery or it shows humans killing humans because it turns out that all these people all these famous people are orphans with a special birthmark meaning that they are all potential werewolves and all come from, or at least supposedly come from, or potentially. I mean, a lot of this is not told very well in the film. So the point is that they might all be the descendants of this noble family. And that's it. That, that I have no idea why they were invited there. I think they have to find the correct heir, and that's why they all show up. But of course, one of them turns out to be a werewolf. It's not really known if she has been a werewolf even before she arrived at the castle of the castle turned it into one. Uh, and I'm spoiling this because, yes, it is a woman. The entire movie we were made to believe that it's one of the men, but it ends with 
one of those cheeky shots where she stares into the camera with a evil look while the man holds her and tells her everything is okay now that the werewolf is dead because of course it isn't she shot one of the guys and the other guy just thought that was the werewolf so yeah that's how it ends it's not a good looking movie it's actually quite a terrible looking movie though not as bad as the fourth one the premise i think the premise could have worked if executed well this movie just isn't this movie is really 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 poorly told and that's what i can say about it it's it's not a good movie it's it's it wastes your time with stupid storytelling and unengaging scenes of murder and yeah i don't know i should also note that the uh, i said that the acting or at least the dynamics between the characters is what made this movie interesting in the first place in the first 20 minutes after around the 30 or 40 minute mark almost all the actors start being terrible and the afterdub work or at least the afterdub work in my version is so awful that it really took me out of it so so the acting goes from being some of the best in the series to being some of the worst which is also sad i don't know what it would have been like if the acting i think an, the acting is really what could have tied something like this together um well an act, acting a bigger budget and better filmography I, I know i think we just needed a better movie the premise is okay everything else isn't well let's then talk about Howling 6, The Freaks, from 1991. This one actually has a fine cast. It's surprisingly not bad. The main antagonist of the film is the same guy who played the Warlock in the Warlock movies and a bunch of other low-budget horror and thrillers. But he's not doing a bad job. And we also have other what's-his-faces in the movie. Uh, probably the only movie in the Howling franchise as, where there are recognizable faces, aside from Christopher Lee, of course. The premise is decent too. It's about a freak show led by Mr. Warlock, which takes in different kinds of freaks. I don't understand if he does things to these people to make them freaks. Or if they are just freaks to begin with. Or if he's just preying on mentally ill people and then decorating them as freaks. It's not really revealed if any of these have powers or not. Which is a big letdown. But that's just how it is. And our main protagonist of the movie is this outsider who comes to this small village looking for a job. And he's taken in by the local priest, who doesn't pay him, but he gives him a bed to sleep on if he helps him rebuild the church. Because, as the preacher says, people have lost faith, or they've lost interest in the church. And a small love story unfolds between the preacher's daughter and our protagonist. And this circus rolls up for this freak show, and she comes on to the protagonist. The protagonist doesn't want her because she is... The son and it would be the, the daughter of, of, of his employer and it would be inappropriate and yada yada all the the, the love subplot of this is, is really not good but it turns out that our protagonist is a werewolf but didn't know about it but i don't understand how long he has been a werewolf for if it's something that the circus did to him or the warlock did to him or if it's something he was born as, again, like so many other movies in this franchise, the story is not told very well. So much is left up for the imagination, or if it is meant to be told, you might not really catch it while watching it. And after he turns, the warlock imprisons him and tries to make him perform for him by making him turn into a werewolf and then trying to have him do uh, atrocious stuff such as killing cats and our protagonist maintains some control over his own actions so he can't kill the cat and that is important meaning that you know not all werewolves become 
uncontrollable beasts. Some can maintain their humanity. Maybe because the costume is so terrible, because it really is. This is the worst werewolf costume we get in any of the movies, simply because the head doesn't look like a wolf. It's more like a human head with, with fur on it, and it's, it's just not good. That's the saddest part about this movie, the costume. It also turns out that the warlock himself is some kind of were-beast. And I really wish I knew what was going on in the film, because when he turns into something, he gets purple, and his face looks more like, I don't know, fish alien thing? So maybe he's a vampire and not a werewolf? Which would make sense, because when he dies, he turns into ashes, which wouldn't make sense if he was just a wolf, a werewolf. But also, I don't remember if we actually, maybe we see him walk around outside, so it might just be unspecified monster, which again is stupid, because I think everybody else in the rest of the franchise refers to this as, as just a werewolf. It's not a good film. It has some okay things, and I just think, after watching all the stinkers, in this in this uh, franchise this is actually not the worst i can't recommend it as it's still a below mediocre horror film but it's more than we get in the other movies oh yeah and of course the movie ends with a big showdown and our hero our protagonist escapes and the villain dies it also has some villages rounded up to take sides and everything it's yeah it has some of the tropes and it's just i think the acting is what makes it tolerable and that's it. That's all I can say. And if that's all I can say about The Freaks, then let's talk about The Howling, New Moon Rising from 1995. It's the first one in the franchise to drop the uh, numerical aspect of the title, which actually makes no sense because this one is the most direct sequel we have had since the second film. It's basically two films, one of which follows this Australian drifter who kind of looks like a low-budget Lemmy, turns out to be a werewolf, and the other part are these two preachers, I think, or a preacher and a policeman maybe, who discuss the werewolves that are still lurking around, because they say that the werewolf escaped from the castle in the fifth movie, they also talk about events in the fourth movie, and then they also talk about events in the sixth film, meaning this is a direct sequel trying to try to tie all the three previous movies together and it doesn't do it very well and I was just surprised that it even tried to. But it has these two old guys talking about how terrible it is that there's a werewolf, but the acting is so terrible, it's so utterly garbage that one of them doesn't even, he doesn't react to anything. He's just a blank slate and the other one is just the, 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 the wise clergyman who knows that these things are around and they need to be stopped. And he just tries to persuade this other guy, who seems to not need persuasion, but still needs persuasion, to come with him to kill this werewolf that's somewhere. And they apparently very easily track where it is, because they show up in this small town in the middle of nowhere, Texas, I think. I don't know how they knew to turn up there, but yes, that's, it turns out that the werewolf is there. Um, so there are two werewolves in it. There's the lemmy looking guy and there's a woman. And the reason why there's a woman is because we learn in this one that werewolves can, if they are about to die or if they do die, they can take the bodies of other people, possess them or just, I don't know. <clears throat> this might be the worst addition to the storyline so far. I mean, yes, there has been magic in it before. But to suddenly have it introduced that werewolves can jump bodies, it's really, really, really bad for the plotline, I would say. And it also adds very little to the overall movie. There's no reason for it. I think the, the only reason for it is that they wanted to, to tie it in with the other movies. And also to try and have a plot device saying why there is a werewolf around killing people in this village as it's trying to find a, a good host and also put the blame on Lemmy, who is the obvious per per person to blame, as he is the drifter. And I should say, this is also kind of a horror comedy, because there are so many, many, many bad jokes in it, 
really, really bad, lame, slapsticky jokes and even worse jokes. A lot of hillbilly music going on with people farting and it's just terrible. Both aspects. Uh, so, so yes, both the scenes we have with, with between the two old people and the scenes we have in the village, they're all terrible. It's really baffling how bad this is. It, it, it feels like two movies were dropped on the cutting room floor and then picked up by a third director who tried to turn those two movies into a comedy. And it's just not worth your time. I, I'm actually a bit mad I saw this because this is this is bad. This is really, really bad. But it's not as bad as the last movie in the franchise. The Howling Reborn from 2011. This movie is ugly. It's incredibly oversaturated in this very, very ugly mid to late 2000s way that just make every scene look like garbage, white garbage. All the colors are just terrible. There's nothing good to look at. And it's so cliche. And I realized watching this, this movie was only made because Twilight was popular. And even if you, even if you didn't believe me just from the rest of will tell you, we do have a lengthy scene in it where our protagonist's friend, who is a low-budget, uh, amateur werewolf movie maker, so he knows all about werewolves, and he talks about how cool werewolves are and how much all other antagonists suck, like vampires, who would ever want to watch vampires. And yes, this is just a movie trying to be better than Twilight. And it is Twilight in all its worst aspects. It's a high school drama with terrible romantic moments. It's not even a romantic subplot. The romantic plot seems to be the main plot. It has bullies, school bullies that are so cliche that it hurts my mind. And it's a movie that just happens. All the scenes are just happening this is a high school drama oh uh, no the worst thing about this movie is probably that it has that really really annoying voiceover by the protagonists who talks about all the events that happened in hindsight this is this is not something that should be in your horror movie or in your werewolf movie or in your howling movie this is not this is twilight but on a very low budget and with absolutely terrible actors no, not a single performance in this movie is good. Some are not bad, just not good. Whereas others are outright terrible. All the antagonists are incredibly terribly, uh, terrible, terrible actors, at least in this film. And... No, no, this was so garbage that I got angry watching it. This, for the vast majority of the film, this is worse than the fourth movie. Remember, the fourth movie, nothing happened. All that happens in this movie is bad. And I was very close to ranking it worse than the fourth movie. But then we actually saw the werewolves. At the very end of the film, we get about three, maybe five minutes with werewolves. And their design is okay. It's surprisingly okay. I mean... 30 years did pass between this and the first one, but I would say that the costumes in this one are as good, if not better, as the first one. And even more surprisingly, they actually seem mostly real, practical. Maybe it's a mix between practical and CGI. It also helps that they're mostly shown in the dark, and that scenes have a lot of shaky cam in it, so it hides their effects more. But they're actually okay. The rest of the film is, is really, 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 really awful. And I do think that I actually do prefer the, the decomposition scene of the fourth one to the werewolf scene of this one. So this is the worst film in the series because it's also cringeworthy. It's actually a social commentary. 
about how modern youth is brought up to view love as this superficial thing and that romantic relationships are nonsense and that you should should just sleep around it's, it's just it's it's nothing is deserved in this film it tries to be so much more than it is and the simple fact that it's just a twilight ripoff or you try twilight knockoff or whatever you would call it makes it so so much worse than anything else in this series because i have just talked shit about these movies for more than 30 minutes but i will give the howling franchise one credit every single movie seems to try something different we don't really get the same story told twice it if it's told twice is at least in a very different setting and with a different setup. This is so much more than I can say for the Puppet Master franchise, the Friday the 13th franchise and even the first two, three Chucky movies or Child's Play movies. That are all those movie all those franchises are quite similar in in, in the sequels. Not that that's a bad thing necessarily, but I do think it's cool that this movie at least tries, that this franchise tries to go for something different. It's only sad that it fails so miserably time after time. So the final verdict is the first movie is worth watching. None of the others are. I think the third one could be watched out of curiosity. But I will never recommend you to watch it, it's just you could watch it out of curiosity to see how how a movie just goes off the rails in the way it does. But that's about it. None of the other movies are worth any second of your time. And the irony is I just spent 45 minutes talking about this, about these movies. And I just wasted your time with it because overall it's just, yeah, don't watch them. Watch the first one. I, but my review could have been this simple. Watch the first one, don't watch the rest. But now I at least try to give you reasons to not watch the rest and, and some context about why this is such a terrible series. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you want more detailed reviews, for every specific film. Um, I'm actually, I was quite detailed, I guess, in this, in this video, but you can always check out my letterbox profile, The Robot Quits. You can find a link in the description. And here you should be able to find my written reviews of all these movies. And these reviews were written right after watching the films. So you can maybe even see more of my frustration there than you can hear in this recording. So take care and have fun. And nothing really happens afterwards. After what? After what? Afterwards? And nothing really happens afterwards. After what? After what? Afterwards?